Hello and welcome to another teaching in the armchair series and today's teaching is called the Amalekites and how to destroy them. I love the Old Testament. Uh, the New Testament flowers that we can pick so easily all have their roots down in the soil of the Old Testament. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 15 46 Paul wrote the spiritual did not come first but the natural and after that the spiritual. So the Old Testament is the natural or the physical and the New Testament is the spiritual. Uh, Jesus quoted from the Old Testament 70 at times. He quoted from Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Psalms, Proverbs, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Amos, Jonah, Micah and Malachi. And the apostles quoted from the Old Testament 209 times. And of course, Jesus' parables always use physical or natural stories to help us to clearly understand the spiritual truths. So the Old Testament really comes alive when you understand how much of it is made up of symbols and types foreshadowing the New Testament. Indeed, in reading the Old Testament, it can help if you have a, a book like, like this one by uh, Kevin Connors, Understanding the Symbols and Types. So, in short, the Old Testament stories, the events and the people, they help to shine light on the New Testament spiritual truths. It's very exciting when you get it. That's why most of my teaching starts off in the soil of the Old Testament before emerging into the bright light of the New. Anyway, this teaching today involves the Amalekites and what a story it is. But first, I need to start way back before the Amalekites appear in the, in the Bible. In Genesis 15, God told Abraham, or Abram as he was originally called, that he was going to establish a covenant with him and his descendants. But as the years went by and no heir was in sight, we read in Genesis 16 that Sarah, his wife, persuaded him to use her Egyptian slave girl to produce an heir. And Abram did so, and the result was Ishmael. Now, in the Old Testament, Egypt symbolises the world and worldliness and bondage. Uh, so God was not going to establish his covenant through someone from a natural birth like us all, let alone uh, one that emerged uh, from someone who symbolised worldliness and bondage. Uh, both the Old and the New Covenants were to be established through supernatural births. And so when Abram was 99 and Sarah well past her natural childbearing age, we read in Genesis 17 where God changes Abram's name to Abraham and Sarai's name to Sarah. And then in verses 17 to 19, we read, God says, your wife, Sarah, will bear you a son and you will call him Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard you. I will surely bless him. I will make him fruitful and will greatly increase his numbers. He will be the father of 12 rulers and I will make him into a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you by this time next year. And so at the tender age of 100, Abraham see, sees Isaac born through his very old wife, Sarah, by a supernatural act of God. And the covenant line begins. Uh, and by the way, I have a teaching online called How Will I Know, which unpacks, which unpacks this Abrahamic covenant in much more detail. I'll put a link at the bottom of the video. Anyway, the new covenant was established through Jesus. So it's no surprise that Isaac symbolizes Jesus, who was born by a supernatural act of God through Mary, a descendant of King David. Many times in the Bible, God states that he is the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, thus symbolizing the Trinity, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Now, God changed Jacob's name to Israel and out of him came the 12 tribes that became known as the children of Israel. Now, Isaac and his firstborn son Esau were the natural inheritors of the mighty promise God had made to Abraham that through his line would come the promised Satan bruiser of Genesis 3.15 and the promised earth blesser of Genesis 12.3. But as we know, Esau sold his spiritual birthright to Jacob for a meal to satisfy his flesh. He placed such little value on his spiritual birthright and so insulted God. That's why in Romans 9.13 it says, As it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. And indeed in Hebrews 12.15-17, God uses Esau to give clear warning to Christians. says, See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God, that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. 
After, as you know, when he wanted to inherit this blessing, he was rejected. Even though he sought the blessing with tears, he could not change what he had done. And so through this incident, one line from Isaac scorned God's blessing and one line from Isaac received it. So Esau's first son, Eliphaz, bore a son called Amalek, Genesis 36, 12, and he was the father of the Amalekites, a people who became despised and feared. They were known as people who took pleasure in, kill in killing and destroying. They were just evil. The worst insult a Jew could be called was a friend of Amalek. Now, the Amalek's original territory was the land of Edom or Seir. Uh, and Edom is the name of the country lying south of the ancient kingdom of Judah and extending from the Dead Sea to the Gulf of Aqaba. It was peopled by descendants of Esau. Uh, and Edom has a remarkable prominence in the prophetic word as together with Moab it's the scene of the final destruction of the Gentile world power in the day of the Lord Armageddon. Anyway, most of us are probably aware of Balaam's famous prophecy in Numbers chapter 24 about the future Messiah, the star out of Jacob. But mostly we miss the rest of the prophecy which centred on Esau's grandson Amalek. It says, out of Jacob shall come he that shall have dominion and shall destroy him that remains of the city. And when he looked on Amalek, he took up this parable and said, Amalek was the first of the nations or the first of the nations that warred against Israel. But his latter end shall be that he perish forever. When Moses, a type of Christ, led God's chosen people out from under the cruel rule of Egypt's Pharaoh, a type for Satan, the ruler of the world, the first and the most persistent enemy they met along the way were the Amalekites. Before the battle at Rephidim, Moses told Joshua to choose men to fight and he would then go up to a hilltop with a staff, which represented God's given authority. Uh, we read in Exodus 79, Moses said to Joshua, choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. Um, Anyway, as the uh, Batland Valley raised, Aaron and Hur stood on the hilltop with Moses in the middle with his arms open wide, a type for the intercessor. He knew that the battle had to be won on the heavenlies first and then it would outwork on the land below. The Apostle Paul confirmed this when he wrote in Ephesians chapter 6 verses 12 and 13, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. When Moses' hands were raised in warfare prayer, the battle went for Joshua. But as Moses tired and his hands fell down, the battle began to go for Amalek. And so Aaron and Hur put a stone under Moses to sit upon and then held his hands up and together the three of them became one and the day was one for Joshua. From this possibly comes Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From whence does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. On a side note, Joshua learnt well from this and during the second battle of Ai in the promised land he stood at the back of the battle with the spear pointed heavenwards until the battle was won. Anyway when the battle between Joshua and the Malachites was over the Lord told Moses to write this down and recite it to Joshua. This is from Exodus 17 14 to 16. Then the Lord said to Moses write this for a memorial in the book and recount it in the hearing of Joshua that I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar, altar and called its name the Lord is my banner, for he said, because the Lord has sworn the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. What God was telling his people was this, that the Amalek, Amalekites would be making war on his people from gener generation to generation. But as they lived in obedience to him, he would always give them victory. Anyway, we next meet the Amalekites with the Midianites. These are types of principalities and powers. Holding God's chosen people in servitude and bondage due to their apostasy. And the Bible says that the children of Israel uh, did evil in the sight of the Lord and he delivered them over to the enemy. In other words, he lifted his divine protection off them and the stronger forces took over. Judges 6 at, uh, verses 1 to 6 says then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord so the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian for seven years and the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel because of the Midianites the children of Israel made for themselves the dens the caves and the strongholds uh, which are in the mountains 
So it was whenever Israel had sown, whatever uh, Israel had sown, Midianites would come up, also Amalekites and the people of the east, east would come up against them. Then they would encamp against them and destroy the produce of the earth as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep nor ox nor donkey. Uh, for they would come up with their livestock and their tents coming in as numerous as locusts. Both they and their camels were without number uh, and they would enter the land to destroy it. So Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord after seven years. And God told Gideon to lead his people against their enemies, the Midianites and the Amalekites. Anyway, the most men that Gideon could muster was 32,000 men. But God told Gideon, Judges 7 2, the people who are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel claim glory for itself against me, saying, My own hand has saved me. Anyway, God told Gideon to tell those who were afraid of the upcoming fight to go home. And I'm sure to Gideon's horror, 22,000 did that. Then the Lord said to Gideon, The people who are here are still too many. Bring them down to the water, and I will test them for you there. So God told him to choose the men who got down on their knees and cupped their hands like a bowl and raised the water up to their mouth and lapped it like a dog and were thus always alert to any surprise attack. But the men who just threw themselves flat on the ground and put their mouth down to the river, uh, they were sent away. This left Gideon with just 300 men. Following ludicrous instructions, these to worldly minds, but in total obedience, Gideon, though vastly outnumbered, advanced on the enemy with oil lamps lit inside clay pitchers. And at the Lord's command, the men blew their trumpets. This is a, always a symbol of gathering, the coming of Christ's judgment and blessing. And then broke open the pitchers and let the light shine into the darkness, which is a symbol of the gospel. The Lord did the rest and once again through obedience victory went to the Lord's people and all the glory went to God. Now this was truly an amazing display of God's power because in Judges 7.12 we read the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the children of the east lay along the valley like grasshoppers for multitude and their camels were without number as the sand by the seaside for multitude. You see it's God's lesson to us. That no matter how few we seem and how numerous and how strong the enemy seems, when we are in obedience to him, no principality or power will have dominion over us or defeat us in battle. When we are for the Lord, we can rest assured that he is for us. Now the history of God's dealings with his people is always that disobedience brings defeat and slavery, while obedience brings victory and freedom. No exceptions. Now the Bible is full of God's anointings or, or appointings. In the Old Testament, the first anointing is in the, Le the Levitical ritual for cleansing healed lepers. Now lepers is always a type for sin, for a sinner. They had to remain outside the city walls, but when they were healed and seeking entry to the city, they had to pass through a purification ritual. Now the leper would approach the priest with his head shaven, this is for a type of humility, and two doves were placed on the altar of sacrifice. One dove was killed, and its blood was put on the other dove before it was released, symbolising the blood of Jesus, cleansing and bringing uh, liberty. Anyway, the blood was, uh, that was then also put on the leper's toe, finger and ear, followed by oil, which of course symbolises the Holy Spirit. Then a lamb without blemish was killed, and of course this is a type of the atonement. And the blood and oil were again placed on the right toe, finger and earlobe, symbolising that where they walked, what they did and what they thought had now been cleansed and put under the Lord's authority. This anointing of blood and oil symbolises the believer's anointing, but the next anointing was the priest's anointing. In Exodus chapter 30 verse 30 we read, God gave instructions for a special anointing oil to be made to sanctify an altar or person. And this anointing was for a person or place that God was setting apart for himself. As such was Aaron's anointing. Exodus chapter 30 verses 30 to 33. And you shall anoint Aaron and his sons and consecrate them that they may serve me as priests. And you shall say to the people of Israel, this shall be my holy anointing oil throughout your generations. It shall not be poured upon the, the bodies of ordinary men, and you shall make no other like it in composition. It is holy, and it shall be holy to you. 
The next anointing was the prophets anointing such as Samuel, Elijah, uh, Elisha and Jeremiah etc. received. People who were anointed uh, to be God's spokesman to his people. Rarely very popular with what they said. And then there was the king's anointing such as reserved for Saul, David and Solomon. So God among his people would have his, his anointed kings, prophets, priests and sin cleansed people. Now Jesus of course was and still is wholly anointed by God's spirit to be our king of kings, our great high priest, the messianic prophet and the sinless son of man. Now Saul received the king's anointing and part of symbolising that anointing was the oil on his shield. In battle the light would be reflected off his gold shield into the enemy's eyes and their bodies and swords and arrows could easily slide off. In Isaiah 21 5 it says arise O princes uh, oil or anoint the shield. So the shield represents our shield of faith and the oil symbolises the Holy Spirit anointing on our faith. Without that Holy Spirit anointing our faith can easily be lukewarm presumption. But listen, the Holy Spirit will not anoint just any shield. We read in Second Chronicles where Jeroboam became unfaithful to the Lord and the Lord allowed Shishak king of Egypt to attack Jerusalem and carry off Solomon's gold shields. Now gold is pure but bronze is an alloy, a mixture. And Jeroboam replaced the pure gold shields with bronze shields. You see, if we want to obtain and retain our anointing, we must make sure that our shield of faith is the shield of faith that God asks for, not a lukewarm mixture of hot and cold. What God seeks is a faith that produces humble, dependent obedience. Obedience like Abraham's or Noah's or Gideon's or Joshua's, the early church. I mean, God can work wonders through a humble and obedient people. The learned Pharisees prided themselves on their doctrinal correctness, but they were cold, arrogant, and they were loveless. As Jesus said, they were like whitewashed tombs. A doctrinal correctness is important, of course, except where it leads to un unteachable spiritual arrogance. As the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, this is First Car uh, Corinthians 8, 1, knowledge puffs up, but love edifies, it builds up. The Pharisees couldn't see how God could do business with tax collectors, fishermen, uh, zealots, Samaritans, uh, Gentiles who knew so little about their doctrine and their theology. But Jesus did and he passed by the loveless, uh, the loveless um, Pharisees. Anyway, Samuel anointed Saul as king, 1 Samuel 10, 1. And despite internal lethargy and opposition, Saul mustered an army and became victorious in battle. He fought enemies on all sides of Israel, including the Malachites, and he enjoyed continual victory. But then came the turning point. He began to have self-confidence more than God-confidence. He started to become a bit proud, a bit arrogant. He, he made mistakes. He began to lose the confidence of the people. Now God saw how Saul was turning away from his former dependency um, uh, on God and had Samuel anoint young David to be ready for kingship at God's appointed time. In fact, it was nearly 15 years before David became king of Judah and another seven years before he was king over all Israel. Anyway, as David grew in the Lord and Saul diminished in the Lord, the time drew near when Saul's independent and lukewarm spirit would reap its uh, cruel harvest. You see, over the generations, the Amalekites had been steadily increasing their hold over the land. And, and I will put a link below this video with charts and maps to illustrate these points. At one stage in Ziklag, while David and his few hundred men were away, the Amalekites ran off with his wives and the wives and children of his men, uh, causing much weeping and, and then anger among the men. Uh, and of course, given a chance, that is what our spiritual enemies, the powers of darkness, will do. They will rob us of all that's precious to us. Uh, they will wreck marriages, families, churches and friendships. But you see, David immediately sought, sought God rather than reacting to the pressure from his angry men and asked God if he should go after them and would God grant him victory. You see, that was the actions of a, of a humble and truly God-dependent man. God said, 1 Samuel 30 verse 8, Pursue, for you shall surely overtake them and without fail recover all. So David went and took back all from the Amalekites. From their early beginnings in Kadesh and Edom, we saw the Amalekites fighting with the Midianites against Gideon. And now at Mount Gilead, we see the Amalekites fighting with the Philistines against Saul, always advancing, advancing across the land. Anyway, one day Samuel came to Saul and said, 1 Samuel 15, 3, Saul, 
go attack the Amalekites and totally destroy all that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put to death men, women and children and infants, cattle and sheep and camels. Saul went into battle with a huge army of 210,000 men and he won. But his independence had been growing and his obedience was shrinking. So he felt sure that he was doing the right thing by capturing the Amalek king Agag and bringing back the rest of the animal herds and all that was good in his eyes. But God saw it differently. He told Samuel that he was sorry he had made Saul king. And so grieved was Samuel that he, he, he wept all night. Samuel then approached Saul and asked him why he had not obeyed the Lord completely. And Saul tried to defend his decision with logic. His men, he said, had taken the best animals to sacrifice them to the Lord in Gilgal. But Samuel said, Behold, it is better to obey than to sacrifice, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. In Judges chapter 15, 22 to 23, it says, Samuel then took his sword and hewed the Amalek king into pieces before the Lord. Mine were those brutal days. Anyway, Saul did repent, but like Moses striking the rock when the Lord told him to speak to it, God was bringing his ministry on earth to an end. You see, God will not have us created thinking they know better uh, than him. And he can only use those who remain humble and obedient. Uh, and God depend. Uh, and Moses disobeyed the Lord and his ministry was shortly over as a result. But his eternal destiny was safe since we read that Moses appeared uh, on the Mount of Transfiguration uh, with Elijah uh, to meet Jesus. And so I, I believe Saul's eternal destiny was safe. But on earth, the anointing power in their faith was removed through their, through their to us, seemingly small acts of disobedience. But when God says no, um, no Amalekites, he really means no Amalekites. She disobedient Saul did indeed turn to witchcraft, the witch of Ender, for purposes of divination regarding his upcoming battle with the Philistines the next day at Mount Gilboa. The sin of rebellion and witchcraft proved to be just, uh, to be linked, uh, just as Samuel had spoken. Earlier in his reign, Saul had banned witchcraft, but now one act of disobedience had opened the door to another. Saul died in battle the following day, along with his son Jonathan. In the last chapter of 1 Samuel 31, Verses 4 to 6 we read, Then Saul said to his armour bearer, Draw your sword and thrust me through with it, lest these uncircumcised men come and thrust me through and abuse me. But his armour bearer would not, for he was greatly afraid. Therefore Saul took a sword and fell on it. And when his armour bearer saw that Saul was dead, uh, he also fell on his sword and died with him. So Saul, his three sons, his armour bearer, and all his men died together that same day. However, the opening chapter of 2 Samuel shows a twist to the story. A young man came from the battleground bringing Saul's crown to David along with this story. He said, as I happened by chance to be on Mount Gilboa, there was Saul leaning on his spear and indeed the chariots and horsemen followed hard after him. Now when he looked behind him, he saw me and called to me and I answered, here I am. And he said to me, who are you? And so I answered him. I am an Amalekite. He said to me again, Please stand over me and kill me, for anguish has come upon me, but my life still remains in me. So I stood over him and killed him, because I was sure he could not live after he had fallen. And I took the crown that was on his head and the bracelet that was on his arm and have brought them here to you, my Lord. You see, Saul had not put an end to the Amalekites, and now an Amalekite had put an end to Saul. See, despite the honour that the Amalekite paid David in bringing the king's crown to him, David had the man killed. Saul had disappointed God and not fulfilled his anointed uh, duties to the fool, but he was still one of the Lord's chosen, and an Amalekite had killed him. So David had the Amalekite killed. Uh, David wrote a lament for Saul, and Second uh, Samuel one to twenty one re read this: "For the shield of the mighty is cast away there, the shield of Saul, not." anointed with oil. It's a sobering lesson to all who desire to be anointed for service. In the book of Esther we read of a plot to massacre all of God's chosen people, the Jews. Only God's chosen vessels, Esther and Mordecai, prevented the end of the people that would eventually provide the Messiah. The man behind the murderous plot was a man named Haman. He was prime minister to the Persian king and he was a descendant of Agag, king of the Amalekites. When the plot failed, Haman was hung on the gallows. You see, the Amalekites stand for sin, for lawlessness, for rebellion. 
and willful sin and deliberate disobedience always gives the enemies of God their legal right to our lives, to our churches and to our land. You see, in Christ we are a royal priesthood, called to minister to God and to reign in life. Revelation 5.10 says, You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on earth. You see, the world, the flesh and the devil are not to reign in our lives. We are to reign in life. In Genesis chapter 4, 6-7, we read where God said to Cain, If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Sadly, he didn't rule over it, and it did have him. Anyway, sin is always crouching at our door, and it desires to have us. The spiritual Malachites are always prowling around, looking for someone to devour. Kill no one sin in your life, and you remove the, you remove the Amalekites' power. God tells us to kill all sin within us or it will grow and increase its territory within us. You see, Elijah understood perfectly and when the battle with, with the, the, the prophets of Baal was over, he had them all put to the sword. Had he spared some, within a short time there would be many again. Like the unclean lepers, we can only defeat sin with the help of God's anointing. <clears throat> and no matter how much honour sin appears to pay us, how much pleasure it seems to promise us, we are to kill it. That's why the cross is our victory symbol. There Jesus dealt with our sin and our lawlessness and provided us with the ongoing means of staying clean. And so he broke and continues to break the power of the enemy. First John chapter 1 verses 5-9 to nine. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light and uh, in him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. You see, the anointing breaks the yoke. Isaiah ten twenty seven says, and the yoke will be destroyed because of the anointing oil. So the yoke of sin will not have dominion over us. But keeping our shield anointed with oil is dependent on our obedience. Continued disobedience or rebellion within us will remove the anointing from our shield of faith and the enemy will soon break in <clears throat> and begin the work of destroying us. While we walk in submission and obedience to God, our shield is always anointed. So can you see why Satan always seeks to get so much willful sin, worldliness and rebellion into the body of Christ? Can you see why Jesus spoke so strongly about lukewarmness? Listen to this Old Testament natural picture of how sin in our camp will lift his presence. This is from Deuteronomy chapter 3 verses 9 to 14. It says, When the army goes out against your enemies, then keep yourself from every wicked thing. If there's any man among you who becomes unclean by some occurrence in the night, he shall go outside the camp, he shall not come inside the camp. But it shall be when evening comes that he shall wash with water, and when the sun sets, he may come into the camp. Also, you shall have a place outside the camp where you may go to the toilet. And you shall have an implement uh, among your equipment, a spade. And when you sit down outside, you shall dig with it and turn and cover your refuse. And here's the point of it all. For the Lord your God walks in the midst of your camp to deliver you and give your enemies over to you. Therefore, your camp shall be holy, that he may see no unclean thing among you and turn away from you. The very first attempt at conquering the village of Ai failed totally because it turned out there was sin in the camp. And only when that sin was dealt with did God, God's people get total victory. See, we will have many battles with Satan and his currency of sin. But sin can have no victory over us when our shield of faith remains anointed. When we become proud, lukewarm and worldly, we start to become more self-dependent. And when we become self-dependent, we become uncomfortable with the idea of God's lordship in our lives. At that point, the door begins to open for the Amalekites to enter. Uh, in Deuteronomy, when Moses was giving the people sundry laws for living and was telling them that all, that all who do unrighteously are an abomination unto the Lord thy God, he then said this. This is in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 17, 17 to 18. Remember what the Amalekites did unto you along the way when you come out of Egypt, when you were weary and worn out, they met you on your journey and cut off all who lagged behind. They had no fear of God. You see, the spiritual Malachites, the demonic powers that are attracted to willful sin, will continually meet us on our spiritual journey. That's why Peter wrote to believers 
uh, as recorded in 1 Peter 5 8. He said this, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Uh, the spiritual Amalekites will attack us, especially when we are weary, worn out, lukewarm and vulnerable. Like animals of prey, they especially look for the easiest of prey, those who lag behind, or those who are close to dropping out. You see, God wants a united body. He wants a united church moving forward. Remember, remember uh, the cloud that led the children of Israel moved only as fast as the slowest person. I love that. God wants a body where the strong help the weak, where the weak are given special care. That special encouragement that, that strengthens them in case they fall prey to the spiritual Amalekites. It's always easy for the spiritually fleet of foot to become impatient with the slower growers. But a united, tightly knit body will not be as easy a, a prey to sin and its consequences if we take a look at our lives, our homes, our jobs, our church, the land the Lord has placed us in uh, and see if we can spot those little sins, the little foxes that were in the vineyard. And can we spot the attacks of the Amalekites? Look, we are given a royal command, destroy the Amalekites. Jesus told his disciples in Luke 10, 19, I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy and nothing will harm you. Sadly, in recent decades, we have seen men who were truly anointed of God gradually become more self-dependent than, than God-dependent, who then secretly opened the door when sin knocked and without their shield of faith being anointed, they fell under the dominion of that sin. And it seems there was always an Amalekite waiting to expose them and kill their previously anointed ministry before the eyes of a watching world. The battle against sin will go on from generation to generation. Moses finished his statement on the Amalekites with uh, these words in Exodus chapter 17 verse 1. When the Lord your God gives you rest from all the enemies around you in the land he has given you uh, to possess as an inheritance, you shall blot out the memory of Amalek under heaven. Do not forget. Using very strong hyperbole, Jesus put it another way to make us, his people, see how, how serious, how dangerous sin is. Matthew 18, 8, if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it from you. It's better for you to enter life maimed or lame uh, with, uh, with, than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and throw it from you. It's better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into the hell of fire. You see, until Christ returns and the battle ceases forever, we will be at war with the spiritual Amalekites from generation to generation. Reject all sin and destroy the Amalekites. Praise God for Jesus' victory established at Calvary for his total authority uh, in heaven and earth and, ben and beneath the earth, for the anointing power of the Spirit that he willingly pours upon his obedient disciples and praise him because as he, as he leads us on paths of righteousness, the Amalekites will not have dominion over us. Anyway, amen. And God bless.